Welcome back to lecture 17. Those are the three uh, different kinds of dipole-dipole interactions. Now you have dipole ion interactions, dipole dipole interactions, and a special variety of dipole dipole interactions are hydrogen bonds. Next up, we have dispersion forces or London dispersion forces. So, dispersion or London dispersion forces, named after some guy named London. So, this is how you explain why something like Iodine is a solid at room temperature. Okay. So iodine is just two iodine atoms you know, bound together. It is entirely nonpolar. But when you look at the periodic table, you see over here, element number 53, is iodine. So that means that each one of those iodine atoms brings 53 electrons with it. So we have 53 electrons here on the left, 53 electrons here on the right, for a total of 106 electrons. And that is a lot of electrons flying around that molecule. And sometimes, you know, very rarely, they will just sort of randomly shift so that you'll have more over here on this side and fewer over here on this side. So. Over here, you'll have, very temporarily, a negative charge, and over here, very temporarily, a positive charge. Hence why it's called dispersion forces, because it's based upon the random dispersion or dispersal of the electrons. Now, these uh, random shifts in charge don't last for very long, but while they last, any molecule that's nearby is going to be similarly affected, because you'll have a negative charge over here, and it's going to, you know, send out an electrostatic force that's going to influence this molecule so that electrons are going to go away from there and over toward that. And that's going to influence a nearby molecule, which is going to influence nearby molecules, and so on. And so this random dispersion of electrons can have a sort of cascade effect throughout the entire substance. And the more electrons there are, the more likely this is to happen and the more significant it's going to be. So you can actually look at the uh, elements in the periodic table and you can see uh, this influence taking place. For example, we'll look at uh, the four halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and they all have the same chemistry but they have very different numbers of electrons. 18 for fluorine, 34 for chlorine, 70 for bromine, and 106 for iodine. When you look at their uh, melting and boiling points, you can actually see the trend. Fluorine's melting and boiling point are down here at about uh, negative 200 degrees Celsius. Chlorine melts at minus 100. It boils. It looks like about negative 20. Bromine melts at about the freezing point of water and it boils at about 60 degrees Celsius, so it's a liquid at room temperature. And then over here you have iodine with its melting point above 100 degrees Celsius and its boiling point at nearly 200 degrees Celsius. So iodine is a solid at room temperature. And that is entirely due to London dispersion forces. And all four of these elements, molecular elements no less, are um, nonpolar. Now you can see that sort of effect um, at play for uh, these uh, elements, or not elements, molecules, compounds as well. Only over here on the left, what we're looking at is not pure elements. We're not looking at London dispersion forces. We're comparing uh, dipole interactions to London dispersion forces. Okay. What we're looking at is hydrogen bound to uh, various other elements. Okay, so this red line is the oxygen group, this blue line is the uh, halogen group, okay, fluorine, chlorine, and so on. So chlorine, bromine, and iodine, down here in this blue line at the bottom, they obey uh, the London dispersion rule. You know, heavier element means more electrons, means more significant London dispersion, means a higher boiling point. Okay, so hydrogen chloride is down here at about negative 80, hydrogen bromide is a above negative 75, hydrogen iodide is somewhere around negative 50. Similarly, you have uh, hydrogen sulfide is at about uh, negative 60, then hydrogen selenide is at, uh, looks like about negative 50, then hydrogen telluride is at about negative 25, negative 15, somewhere around there. 
Okay, so heavier elements have a higher boiling point. Okay? But over here on the far left, you see this massive leap that completely defies that for hydrogen fluoride and water. And that is because of hydrogen bonding. Uh, hydrogen fluoride has a boiling point about 25 degrees, and water, of course, has a boiling point at 100 degrees. So hydrogen bonding is far more powerful than London dispersion forces are, because it is a, not just a dipole, it is the strongest of the dipoles, and it actually uh, can induce um, bonds, S sort of pseudo-bonds. Um, water is a very highly structured liquid. It has far more structure than most liquids, which is saying something because lots of liquids can have structures. Okay, so the next bit we're going to discuss is uh, different models, different theories. Uh, some of them uh, for explaining bonding. Different models, different theories for explaining bonding. They are more or less useful than uh, Vesper, depending upon what you want to discuss. Vesper is really, really good at explaining molecular geometry. You need other models to explain other oddities, though. So valence bond theory is an attempt to explain why and how atoms share electrons to form a covalent bond. So what it says is that the valence orbitals of two electrons, each one containing a single, uh, sorry, of two atoms, each one containing a single electron, they overlap. Now the electrons are free to move between the orbitals of the two atoms, and the result is a more stable arrangement. So, for example, you have a hydrogen atom with a single electron in its 1s orbital, and then you have, say, oxygen with an unpaired electron in a 2p orbital. You bring them together until the two overlap. Okay, so this is oxygen 2p orbital. Um, just go ahead and make that clear. That's oxygen. So you bring them together until they overlap, and it looks something like this. And now you have the two electrons that are free to move anywhere between the two orbitals. And then, you know, here's uh, oxygen's other p orbital overlapping with the other hydrogen, and you have water. So this is a fairly good start. Um, for explaining why things form uh, bonds. The reason it's a good start is because it includes orbitals, and we know orbitals exist. But it doesn't explain other things, like bond angles, because p orbitals are 90 degrees apart, so the bond angle for water should be 90 degrees, but it's not. We know it's 104.5. So this approach doesn't explain bond angles. It uh, is insufficient. So it needs to be continued. And that's where we come up with hybridization theory. This one actually is useful, and the results that come from it get carried on throughout uh, different forms of chemistry. You still see variants of valence bond theory occasionally crop up uh, in various um, branches to explain, you know, this, there, that, or the other, you know, but it's not hugely popular in the way that uh, Vesper and hybridization are. So what hybridization says is that you form hybrid orbitals. For example, okay, methane is carbon bound to four hydrogens. So carbon needs four, uh, let's see, four bonding orbitals. And not only that, these bonding orbitals need to be all exactly the same. So that the four bonds, one with each hydrogen, are all exactly the same. Fortunately, carbon has four orbitals available. It has its 2s and its uh, 2p orbitals. So 2px, 2py, and 2pz. So in order to make its four bonding orbitals, it will add all of these together to make hybrid orbitals. And each of those orbitals will be exactly the same, and it will be a mix 
of the orbitals that came in. And the strength of uh, hybridization theory is that it explains why paired electrons participate in bonds. Okay? The paired electrons of carbon's s orbital, the 2s orbital, are perfectly happy. They are paired, they're at a low energy. Why do they participate in chemical bonds? Because in order to make those four bonds and end up more stable, it has to mix that s orbital with the p orbitals. And the result is different hybrid orbitals, and then, then form bonds with the hydrogens in the methane molecule, and that results in lower overall energy. And this also explains our bond angles in three dimensions, because these hybrid orbitals, when you do that nasty three-dimensional math, match our expectations from other three-dimensional math. <laughs> it explains the 120 degrees of trigonal planar, it explains the 109.5 degrees of tetrahedral, even though those don't show up in the basic orbitals themselves. So, the way it works is that you have as many hybrid orbitals as you had orbitals to begin with. So, going back to carbon, you know, carbon had a 2s orbital, and then a 2p, a 2p, and a 2p. So, three orbitals went in, or sorry, four orbitals went in, and thus four orbitals come out. And the resulting orbitals are different from the original orbitals, but you have the same number of orbitals. So these orbitals are called hybrid orbitals, and they are referred to a bit different. So if you mix a 2s orbital and a 2p orbital, the result is going to be two sp orbitals. It is a single orbital that is both s and p. Then you have this other orbital that is both s and p. So for example, if you mix 2s and 2px, here is your s orbital. It's a nice regular sphere, and then here's your 2px orbital. Okay. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, because I don't want to work too much with these, these hybrid orbitals, and especially not with molecular orbital theory. But you may have noticed, looking at the pictures in the books, that the two lobes of the p orbital have different colors or different shades. One is dark, one is light. And that's because this has a negative sign, and this has a positive sign. And the negative and positive, it's part of the math, and it's important to the math, but don't read any physical meaning into that, because it's kind of abstract. Okay. But this guy does, does only one color, so it's all positive. All right, so when you mix these together, the positives add together, positive and negative cancel out. So you have, uh, sorry, S. So you have S plus P and S minus P. That's how you get two orbitals. And so S plus P is going to be positive plus positive, x positive, positive plus negative, minimal. So you get, and then positive minus, it goes in the other direction. So you get these two lopsided hybrid orbitals. Okay, this is an sp, and this is also an sp. So they're pointing in different directions. So if this were all by itself, say in carbon dioxide, then you know, you'd have the sp going out this way, and another sp, Let's go ahead and use a different color, going out in the other direction. Okay. They're both still centered on the carbon atom, but now one of them reaches way out to the left, the other one reaches way out to the right. Okay. So it can inter overlap more effectively. And you get uh, similar results if you have S, a P, and a P, except three orbitals in, three orbitals out. So they're going to be sp2. And it'll be like this, and like this, and, ooh, that's terrible, and like this, okay, to form that triangular shape. And this is an sp2 hybrid, this is an sp2 hybrid, and this is an sp2 hybrid. They're pointing in different directions, but they're all otherwise exactly the same. And of course, you can do s plus p plus p plus p, and you get an sp3 hybrid. And now it points up and down, and left and right. Okay. <laughs> yes, that looks terrible, but the point is that you have these four hybrids, all exactly the same, except they're pointing in different directions. And this also gives us a very simple way to refer to the hybrid orbitals, because, you know, sp shows that there's an s and a p. sp2 is an s and two p's. sp3 means there's an s and three p's. 
this can be a little bit confusing. You know, the superscript here is not the number of electrons. It, it just refers to how many p orbitals. Okay. We don't need to talk about how many electrons are showing up in these hybrid orbitals because they're always going to be paired because it's a bond. So we just need to worry about how many orbitals are participating in the bond. And I think we will pause it there for the moment. It's been about 15 minutes. We will uh, come back again in the next lecture, number 18.